How are we doing, One Church Family? You guys all right? Good. My name is Blake Bergstrom, and I just want to welcome everybody. If you're new around here, we are so glad that you would come and try this place out. And we hope you already are going, man, I already feel like I'm at home. And so we're just really glad that you would come. And uh, let's do something. I'm kind of always blown away by how many people and how many countries watch um, online all around the world. Will you let them know that you're grateful that they're here? It's great to have you wherever you're at in the world. Um, While we're clapping, can we celebrate that last week on Resurrection Sunday, we had over 2,000 people here at this church that came. Man, it was amazing. Great to have all of you. If you're new and you came back, thanks for coming back. And I have a couple of things to tell you. If you are new around here and maybe you've like been kicking the tires and considering a church home and a church family to join, today, after this service, we're having what's called Discover One Church. And that's where you can ask all the questions, anything you might be curious about, where we line up and how, what we believe, et cetera. And then you can meet our staff and get to know them and the ministry that they do. But you can also eat free tacos. And so usually that's why people come. And so uh, if you'd like to come to that, you're more than welcome to be there right after this service. Uh, we'd love to have you. Um, another thing I wanna tell you about is that this coming week, this Saturday and Sunday, we're gonna honor our heritage. And so we're having an event called Honor Our Heritage. Do you see what I did there? It's a brilliant play on words. Our, our church used to be called Heritage. And so we're gonna actually have our founding pastor, Greg Marksberry, and Doug Fultz come back, and we're gonna have like a panel discussion about all the things that God's done in their lives uh, as they were kind of starting this church and dreaming about uh, how, what to do with heritage and sort of part of their story. And so um, in honor of that, I thought, man, instead of having a massive party where we just kind of like are self-focused, what if we had uh, a way we can give back to our community and bless our community? And so this year, in honor of our heritage, we're gonna actually build two houses on Saturday for Help Build Hope. And man, it's gonna be epic. It's gonna be so amazing. It's gonna be a great day. We'd love to have you come and help us build two full frames of a house and give them away. And so it's gonna be really special. But then the next morning, uh, I wanna have those two guys here to talk about ways that God has moved in our past uh, to help this church become what it's become in the past 25 years. And so it's gonna be really special. We'd love to have all of you. If you have people that used to attend Heritage, feel free to invite them and have them come and be a part of that day because it's gonna be a pretty special day. All right, so today um, we are continuing our series called Revival. And during this series, I, I just need you to know the heart of where this came from. My prayer is that we as a church would passionately cry out to God that we would uh, ask for God to be more present in our lives than ever before. That we would show up in a way that's kind of like leaning in to the movement of God with an expectant heart. And um, I, I know that many of you know that God is present, but what we talked about last week is that his presence is not always perceived. A lot of times we don't see it and we're not paying attention and we're blind uh, to, to God's movement on the earth. And so I'm asking that we would ask Holy Spirit to bring an awakening, that there'd be a quickening in our spirit, that he would actually breathe life into each of us individually and corporately to restore us and to renew us and to revive us again. We talked about last week that revival, that word simply means to return to life. It's like a a renewed use, it's, it's to live again, and it's to revitalize. And every time I've been a part of revival, I, I've always felt the Holy Spirit like turn something old into something new and beautiful and valid again. And how many of you here believe that God loves to do that, that he's the God of restoration? You guys believe that? Well, I love um, the idea of restoration. In fact, in Psalms, in, in chapter 23, that many of you are familiar with, it's talking about a great shepherd who leads his sheep beside still and quiet waters. And then he also does something else. It says that he restores our soul. Like, I, I think we need to talk about that. What's it look like to have a restored 
soul. Revival always seems to do that. There's this restoration process in the hearts and the minds of God's children. And so it always starts with one thing. It, it starts with you. Revival begins internally. It's a part of your soul. And it's when we turn back to God and we repent of our sins. And then there's always repentance along with desperation. And those two things brings this yearning and this hunger, a longing for life to return. It's crying out in desperation for the restoration of my soul, Lord. Like, like a deer that's panting for water. And then when we turn to him and we repent, the Lord shows up. He pours himself out. Heaven breaks out. And so I, I just need to tell you that this isn't just something that I, um, like it's just something I just wanna, you know, I've gotta do this do a sermon. I'm just preaching something that's not from my heart. This is my very, like, well, when I was moving here, my wife and I, we're both praying that God w would do something grand in our lives. And so I had been traveling for six years and I hadn't been in the local church for a long time. I had been 20 years in full-time vocational church work and I stepped out because of a lot of junk that happened in the church that I had grown disheartened towards a lot of church leaders that I just felt like were liars and manipulators and cheaters and I was like, I, I'm gonna push away from the table. And my wife thought he'll never go back to the church. He'll never serve in a local church again. But then in 2000 and late, or early 2019, the Lord started waking my wife and I up in the middle of the night with similar dreams and visions. This doesn't happen to us. It was really weird. And we kept talking about seeing the same thing. And what we kept seeing was... Um, uh, land that was dry and weary and that he was gonna burst forth on this land, that like a geyser was gonna explode and what was once brown and colorless and lifeless was gonna flourish with color and, and that the Lord's Holy Spirit was gonna bless the people and the land on it. And so I believe that that's happening here. You don't dedicate 400 babies if something new isn't coming to life. You, you don't see so many baptisms and so many people being drawn to the Father. Make no mistake, a large crowd like we had last week is only evidence that people are being drawn to the heart of God. And I just have to ask why, Lord? Why, why are you, you, why is your favor blessing and anointing on this house? And, and I, I'm blown away that I, I hear people say, even this morning, I can just feel the spirit of God here and I feel like I'm part of a family and this is what I've been looking for. First time he's ever been here. People walk onto our land and they start crying. I hear evidence of the Lord's power and presence being very like palpable. You can feel it. And so I believe that God is doing a new thing. He's fulfilling a dream and a vision that the Lord gave my wife and I. And what's happening is very familiar to the very end of this book in Revelation 21, it's what John the Revelator speaks about in the final words that the Lord wants to say in the very end of this book. And here's what he said in verse five of chapter 21. He said, he who was seated on the throne said, so this is God himself speaking. He said, I am making everything new. And then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. And then he says, to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. And so that declaration by John is the same declaration that I wanna speak over this house and this, this land and these people I believe that it's only by the power of God that can make everything new. And so that's the name of this message today. And I want you guys to say something with me out loud. Repeat after me, say, God will make a way where there seems to be no way. 
my mama's sitting here and she said that to me my whole life, so it's kind of meaningful. <laughs> this kind of language that John is speaking, remember when he read the Torah, he would open scrolls and he would read from different prophets and Isaiah was always the Jewish nation's favorite. They just loved to read from Isaiah. And so this language is coming from Isaiah where he says in 43, 18 and 19, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. And now, now, everybody say now. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Sometimes we know his presence is with us, but his presence is not always perceived. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? And then he says, I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. I don't know if you guys have seen footage, but right now in the desert, in the wilderness of, I can't remember exactly where, I just know that it's in Iran or it's close to Jordan or Israel, in that area, if somebody knows, what is it? Do you guys know? There's streams that are busting forth and it's like creating rivers in the desert. And so I believe that prophecies are being fulfilled and it's preparing us for the, the return of our savior. You guys know he's coming back, right? Yeah. And so um, I, I don't know why. Well, why is God fulfilling these prophecies and why is the Holy Spirit busting out on over 20 college campuses? Why? It makes me go, God, are, are you bringing revival and renewal to the people and to the land? Clearly, clearly that's what's happening. And so I love that as, as John is reading from Isaiah, he also is talking about a verse in chapter 44 that says, Yahweh is the first and the last Besides me, there is no God. So he's coming back to Isaiah 43, I mean, Isaiah 43 and 44, where, where he's quoting this idea that God's restoring all things, he's making all things new, but do you know who God is? I'm gonna remind you in case you forgot. We're talking about the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Now, alpha is the first letter in the Greek and omega is the last. And so what's he saying? He, he's amplifying the thought that there ain't no other God, as we say in Georgia. All life starts and stops with him. He's the beginning. He's the end. Not only the beginning, but what John is actually saying, he's actually the source of all life, and he is the goal of all things. He's the start and the stop. He's making the point that all life begins and ends in God. Let me say it like this. God is the source of all life. Man, without God, is nothing. While I was at the VA with my dad recently, this nurse found out I was a pastor and she pulled out her phone and she said, I have to read you this. And I was like, okay, awesome. So she reads me this thing that's on her phone and I was like, that's like really good. In fact, I need to preach that. Can I take a picture of it? And she said, yes. So I'd like to share with you what she said. She said, when God wanted to create fish, he spoke to the sea. When God wanted to create trees, he spoke to the earth. When God wanted to create man, he turned to himself. And then God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. If you take a fish out of water, what'll happen? It'll die. And when you remove tree from soil, what'll happen? It, it'll die. Likewise, when man is disconnected from God, he dies. God is our natural environment. We were created to live in his presence. We have to be connected to him because it's only in him that life exists. Let us stay connected to God. We, we recall that water without fish, it's still water. But fish without water is nothing. The soil without a tree, it's still soil. But the tree without soil, nothing. God without man 
is still God, but man without God is nothing. The name of God is yod heh vah It's four letters. It's called the Tetragrammaton. And Hebrew scholars would actually not speak the word out loud because it was so holy and sacred. It was actually pronounced for us that need consonants in America, in English language. We say Yehovah. We say Yahweh. But those four consonants actually were pronounced yod heh vah And Hebrew scholars, when they would say it, instead of speaking it, they would actually breathe it. They would say, And the reason for that is God's spirit is what was breathed into Adam. Adam in the Greek actually means dirt man. And so what did God do? He grabbed a chunk of dirt and breathes his life. So you can make the case that once you can actually speak or breathe the name of God, you have life. And when you breathe your last name of God, you no longer have life. That's why I love every time we baptize somebody here, we give them a shirt that says, raised to life. And it's because you are literally walking dead until you have the source of life inside of you. I'm preaching today. Ooh. Did you see that little, mm. I don't know what that was, but I felt something. <laughs> Our creator loves us enough that he created us to spend time with us. That's a bizarre thought. He breathes his life into us and sustains us so we can actually be in his presence. We just don't always perceive it. But when we are in his presence, we are most alive. And when we walk in rebellion and sin and darkness, we're literally dying. We're running from our source of life. Why would we do that? Apart from Christ, we're nothing, it says in John He's the vine, we're the branch, and if we break off, what happens? We wither, because he's the source of life. He doesn't want us to be disconnected from him. He created us for deep and meaningful intimacy and life connection in the power of of, of the Spirit. That's the heart of God. He always wants to make a way where there seems to be no way. He, He brings streams of living water in, in the valley of our soul, in our wasteland. And he, he places uh, his life in dry and barren places because he loves to revitalize. He is the God of new beginnings and second chances. He's always been the God who brings revival. And so today I wanna teach you about a revival that is fascinating to me. I just love talking about it. It's actually the Cane Ridge Revival. And if you've been around, that's, that's the picture of it there with people preaching. They built these stands. And, and would you believe that there was probably 20 to 25,000 people that came in their horses and their wagons and they showed up in this field and it's a gigantic camp meeting and it's called the Cane Ridge Revival in Cane Ridge, Kentucky. Now, it's weird to talk about because some crazy stuff happened. And it's even funnier to me that it happened in the Christian church and the churches of Christ because a lot of times we're known for being very conservative. We don't like things to get crazy and we're not gonna use emotionalism. But I don't know if you know this, but when we follow God, it's pretty emotional. And he likes our emotions, he gave them to us. And so what happened was some people say that this was a campfire meeting that the fire of God dropped on. In fact, some have considered it to be the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit since Pentecost. It was in August of 1801. And people showed up with this expectant heart. They were begging. They were desperate for a move of the Spirit. And so they were crying out for his power and presence to show up. And our very own uh, Bart Stone, Bart Stone and Alexander Campbell, this is often called the Stone Campbell movement, the restoration movement is actually what this is called. And so I think it's fitting that we're talking about restoration today. 
Um, so in fact, this beautiful thing happened with Bart Stone where he's like explaining this to other people that are super conservative. And I just can imagine him saying this out loud and them going, uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, what? Because he said at this tent meeting, there was running. They were, they were, we don't do that in church. And there was dancing. Baptists just started squirming a little bit. They were moving their hips. It's a no-no. It actually says people were falling down. They were falling out in these fields, right? And that people started barking. In Dog Nation, we're like, Ruth, come on. That's the Holy Spirit, right? And, and it also says that there was jerking. I'm not sure what that was. But people are, you know, I'm not gonna do it anymore. So, so this revival... It swept over the land, and what happened was people who had been disheartened, especially from the church in America, they wanted nothing to do with that anymore. They were tired of Western religion, and they showed up hungry for a movement of the Holy Spirit, and it went on for years. It restored and revitalized many who had become apathetic, cynical, and jaded towards the church and towards the church people. I'm gonna share a story that's not in my notes and I probably shouldn't share it, but it's hilarious. When people came here in America and they were like, there was people that were doing circuit writing to preach at different churches, right? They were baptizing people and (laughs) they loved whiskey. And they were like, I still wanna drink whiskey. And sometimes I punch people with my right hand. So since I drink whiskey with my right hand and I punch people with my right hand, when you baptize me, will you leave my right hand out? <laughs> that's so funny to me. So they get, boom, and drink whiskey. Anyways, that's so dumb. But it's true. And so I, I love the idea that God loves to restore and renew the heart of his children. Can I get an amen? amen. He loves to take old things that are left for waste and restore and renew them into something brand new and beautiful. That's the heart and nature of our God. He, he loves to do that in the hearts of barren souls, and especially in kids. He wants to restore and renew and revive us back to life. And so that's the idea that Paul is actually talking about in 2 Corinthians 5, when he says, therefore, if anyone that used to be dead is now in Christ, the new creation has come, and the old has gone, and the new is here. Does anybody want that? Well, I've shared this story with you before, and um, I'm sorry for those of you that have heard this before, but it's such a beautiful picture of restoration that I I wanna share it again. So when I was 15 years old, uh, there was a truck that sat in our backyard for 12 years. So imagine that, I'm 15. This truck's been sitting there for three, since I was three years old. I've always seen this truck sitting in the same spot. I had spent my whole life weed eating around this stinking truck. And so my dad, he said to me, hey, hey, son, here's the deal. When you are old enough to drive, I'm gonna give you that truck. <laughs> Didn't he, mom? And I was like, thanks, dad, for giving me a piece of crap. <laughs> and so I, I remember going, I, I, I don't know what to do with this. In fact, I have a picture of an old truck that looked similar. Here's, here's what it looked like. He's made her from cars. Maybe that's why I love him so much. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So that was my first truck. And here's, here's where I was at. I was like, I don't, I don't know where to start, Dad. What do I do? And my dad said, well, here's a manual. And he gave me, you guys remember those manuals you get for, there was no YouTube, right? I didn't, I didn't have internets. I was just a 15-year-old kid with a book and a dream and a really ugly hunk of junk in the, in the yard. And so if I needed parts, we'd go and climb over mountains of cars that were, I don't see them anymore, but they were called junkyards. Have you heard of those? And so I would climb and I'd pull things out of old cars and I, I had to replace everything. Let me just give you a small list. I gave it a new radiator, new carburetor, new transmission, new starter, new solenoid, new ignition, new clutch, new tires, new seats, new stereo, new brakes, new lights, just to name a few. And I knew every part of that truck inside and out. There wasn't one part that I hadn't worked on. 
Not to mention, it was filled with rust. I'm talking eaten up. And so I learned how to sand and put down to the metal and then put new metal on and Bondo and fiberglass, whatever it was. And you guys ever done that? There's four of you that know how to do that? Yeah, does anybody know how, really? Okay, there's one, there's five, five, great. Okay, so there was one hole that was in the floorboard that I really shouldn't tell you the story, but I'm gonna. I was driving across the field and that floorboard was like right where you push the, gra- the gas. And I cut across the field and I had just picked up a girl that I didn't know. It was my first date with her. And she happened to be wearing a white blouse. And I cut across this field and I hit a mud puddle. And so mud came through the floorboard and pfft, like right on her and I was like, oh, my land, what do I do? And so I drive her home, like, we'll get you a new shirt, I'm so sorry. And everything worked out, but we, did, we didn't work out. We didn't work out, but... Anyways, and so I, I'm telling you, it was just eaten up with rust, and I, it was like so much work, and, but I'll tell you that somewhere inside of me, I was like, I'm doing that. Maybe it's because my dad challenged me, but I wanted it, and I knew I could do it, and so I saw past all of the flaws and the rust, and I had a vision for what it could become, and my friends, they made fun of me. They laughed at me. They were like, you, 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 it's, gonna, it's never gonna, why, right? And I said, you just wait. You don't see what I see. And maybe today, some of you are there. Like, you feel like you're too far gone. Your life is too eaten up with junk. And maybe you feel like you're a lost cause and too broken. And the idea of actually trying to restore your life break free from the addictions, find yourself clean when you feel so dirty. It feels like restoration and revival seems like way too much work. And maybe today, if we were sitting down at coffee, you would say, I, I, Pastor, I just feel so dirty. Too much, too painful to go through and hash through all the things in my past. And to remove it all seems impossible. And maybe you have turned from God and you've walked away from the source of life and you've lost your faith and the storms of this life has beat you down and maybe you just wanna give up. Today, do you mind if I remind you that whether you believe it or not, the very nature of the God that we serve is a God who gets really excited about the restoration of his creation. His ways are not our ways. He sees you differently than you see you. And he still has a plan and a purpose for everyone in this room, and he can make a way in the wilderness where there seems to be no way. And our creator, God, wants to redeem you. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you back to life so you can be even more beautiful than what you used to be. He wants to be more intimate and closer than you've ever experienced, if you'll allow him. With that in mind, would you guys like to see the restored picture of my beautiful old blue? Well, here it is. Come on! She's gorgeous. Right there, that that ain't no mater right there. That ain't mater. So... When that thing fired up and I was in the backyard, we had to actually tear down the fence, didn't we, Mom, to be able to drive that thing out. It had sat there so long that we got fenced in. And so I broke that thing out. When I started that thing up and it roared for the first time, you should have seen my dad's face. He lit up. He was jumping up and down in the yard. And I'll tell you, as a 60, 17-year-old kid, it felt like a rite of passage like something that was nasty and old had become beautiful. And I'll tell you all week as I've been thinking about that happening in the hearts of God's children, the restoration of our souls, I just keep thinking back to the incredible account of Isaiah in chapter six. What happened was God's presence dropped down and a train of his robe filled the temple with his glory. And you know what happened as soon as Isaiah was actually in the presence of God? The first thing he recognized 
was the holiness of God. And then in the presence of God's glory and his holiness, what did he do? Woe, woe to me. I am ruined. My lips are unclean. He actually says, I'm a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. The God of the angel armies was in his presence and he recognized immediately just how filthy he was. He says, I am ruined. I'm ruined. I'm a wasteland. I, I am so unclean. And he's not speaking just about his lips because he's spoken bad things. He realizes that his very essence is completely depraved in the presence of God's holiness. He recognizes that he is dirty and filthy, like um, like filthy rags. But you know what? Our God didn't let him sit there and stay there and say that over himself. He heard that and he said, hold up. Let, Let me talk to that uncleanness that you feel. God did not want him to believe the lie that he is ruined. In fact, he did the opposite. God immediately says to him, I'm gonna restore you and I'm gonna send you. I'm gonna restore you and I'm gonna send you. He said, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? He said, hold up, you dirty, unclean man. Whom shall I send and who will go? It's, it's his way of saying to Isaiah, you're still worthy. I still have a plan and a purpose. And Isaiah says what? Here am I. Pick me, send me, I'll, I'll go. I think it's easy for a lot of us to see the darkness in, in the world and the depravity and the chaos and the dissension and all the things in our government and you know, all the things that cause fear inside of us that's happening in the world right now. And to ask the question, Blake, really, do you, do you really think that God's doing a new thing? I think it's really easy for us to sort of sit back with a pious, pompous spirit and say, I, I don't believe it. I don't, I don't, I don't, Blake, I know it's happening at 20 campuses, whatever. Could could God really do that right now in our country, in this land, in this city, in my house? And you're saying God could use me? He could make me new? See, when we look at the world that's so broken, the filth and depravity and sin of this world, it's everywhere. And it's destroying a lot, isn't it? Hatred and anger and death and destruction, hunger and famine, sickness and disease. It feels like it just keeps getting worse. Well, that's what the Lord said would happen. And it's easy for us to look at all of it and just become jaded, apathetic, and to actually lose hope. And to say, you know what? In the light of all that's happening in the world, I just wanna give up. I don't, I don't care. And I get it. A, a world with so many uncertainties, it causes doubt. And the more that we see outwardly demonic forces at work in the world, that are just in our face, it's shoved in our face. Evil at the highest level of government blatantly becoming more and more dark and evil. I believe that as we swing towards darkness and evil as a country, that that's actually backfiring on the plans of the enemy and people are returning back to the holiness and the goodness of our God. And that's what's causing revival. People are turning from their wicked ways and. And so maybe the day is your day. And maybe for you, it's time to stop running from God and turn back towards God's holy face. Amen. Maybe it's time for you to say, God, would you do a new thing in me? I'm gonna run hard towards you in desperation to actually completely surrender my life to you for the first time. In fact, I dare you to say this small prayer to the Father right now. And maybe you've never said it. Try, I dare you to try it. Just say, I, I give you everything. Bring revival to my soul. Give you everything. Bring revival to my soul. When, when we say that, we're yielding to the Father and, and we're saying, 
God, take control of my life. We were recognizing that apart from Christ, we're nothing, that there's no life in us. It's declaring, I, I surrender. I'm completely yours. Lord Jesus, forgive me of my past. I give you everything. I'm, I'm done. I'm done with myself and my striving and my trying and all my doubts. And Father, I surrender it all to you. Would you come and do a new thing in me? Now, I'm gonna speak some truth over your life because I believe in a room this large. Many of you are filled with filth and dirt. I'm gonna say something to you. Maybe, maybe you think that God is not for you and that he's actually against you. Maybe you believe that the bad things that have happened to you were because of him and you've actually placed blame and pointed fingers on God. Well, can I lovingly tell you that that is not the heart of God. God always wants to see his children and their hearts and their souls that are heavy to, to come to life, to be restored. He, he loves you and he is for you. Let me tell you what your loving God does not want. God does not want us to walk in rebellion and to live disconnected and disobedient and running from the source of life. He does not want the sins of our past to keep us from stepping into our destiny. He does not want us paralyzed by the shame and the guilt of what we did. He does not want us to believe the lies of the enemy that tells us that we will never be good enough. That's not the heart of God. Here's the truth of what our Father God wants, and I'm fixing to preach. I don't care what you've been told. Your past doesn't get to define you, and it does not matter. God is always looking to do a new thing especially in the hearts of his kids. He wants you to feel delighted and loved and adored by him. He wants us to be set free from the bondage of sin and darkness and addictions and hell. And when we surrender to him, we're repenting of our sins, we're confessing with our mouths, then God does something beautiful. He gives us a new name and a new song. We start singing, the old's passed away and the new has come. We, we are turned into a new creation. And that creation walks in new life. King Jesus ushered in this brand new teaching that gave us a brand new covenant. And now we have a new commandment. And our future hope is that he is going to heaven and he's making a new heaven and a new earth. And today I'm here to declare that if you'll let him, our God can make a way where there seems to be no way. He can restore the pain of your past. He left heaven and he broke all the chains of bondage and he set us free. Jesus gladly gave his life as a ransom for many by dying on a cross for you and for me. And if you'll place your faith in him today in a second, he can make you brand new. You can walk in complete freedom. And because that is the heart and the nature of our God, he's the God of restoration today. I proclaim that Jesus wants to make all things new. Does anybody here believe that? <laughs> Uh, thank you. And so I'd like to ask everybody here to close your eyes. Turn your hearts towards the heavens. Place your hands on, on, on open to the Father. And just say, God, restore me. Renew me. Bring revival. Forgive me. Wash me clean. Make me brand new, Lord. I'm hungry for you. I'm desperate for you. I repent of my sins. Would you give me a hunger for your word, Lord? Would you fill me with the power of your spirit, Lord? And would you send me out to bring revival and restoration to the earth? Praise you, God. We love you. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for making a way where there seemed to be no way. And now we have the promise of eternal life with you forever in heaven, worshiping with the angels, saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We rest in that promise today, Father. You're so good. You're so good. We love you, Lord, with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength.